John Bunyan had a uh, most famous work called Pilgrim's P- Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is about Christian, or Pilgrim, he starts out Pilgrim, who uh, leaves the city of destruction to head to um, the celestial city. And um, on his back, as he embarks on his track, is a huge burden, a, ba- a sack of sin on his burden that he is um, wearily weighed down by. And he lumbers along under the weight of it and is seeking a means by which he can be relieved of it. One of the favorite uh, board games that my family has and my grandchildren um, want to play it almost to nuisance is a game called Pilgrim's Progress. And in this game, you start out with these little, cre- these little game pieces that are plastic game pieces. And on the, it's, a, it's a man, and on the back of it is a burden of sin. And the game, you roll, you roll um, objects of chance, and um, you get to move however many spaces that it tells you. And um, uh, then you have an opportunity to land on, there are, I think, uh, six spaces, there's, uh, or five spaces, because there's uh, six on that cube, and there's a chance that you, five out of six chances that you can land on one of those. And if you land on one of those, then we sing a song together, clapping and singing, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away, every burden of my heart rolled away, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away, every burden of my heart rolled away, all my sin had to go beneath the crimson flow, hallelujah, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away, every burden of my heart rolled away, and we take that little, pluck that little burden off, and we put it over in the grave, and then they move on toward the celestial city. So it's a great, great game. Um, It really is a game of providence, not chance, I will insist. But anyway, (laughs) there is um, a a marvelous depiction in that of the desire to be relieved of the burden of sin. Everybody, as they live their lives, stuffs their sack of sin full. And it becomes increasingly laborious, laden with all of those things that we have done that have offended God. And try as we might, we cannot offload it. Even the more we are endeavoring to do so, the more heavy it seems to become. To outweigh, you know, they'll do good things trying to outweigh the bad things, but the bad things continue to be there. And putting objects on other parts of your body does not alleviate the burden that's on your back. You can dress all you want, but the burden is still there. In our text today, we have the good news given to us directly by our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. In these verses, in verses 45 through verse 49, we read this. This is when Jesus appeared to his disciples, resurrection day evening in the upper room. We looked at these verses last week, so I'll just pick up in verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. In these verses, Jesus gives us our purpose. The corollary or um, similar account to this that is even more full in its exposure of what his intentions are for us is found in Matthew 28 called the Great Commission. But the purpose of the believer and the reason for which we have been redeemed not only is to bring glory to God through the relationship that God bestows upon us through knowing his son, Jesus Christ, 
but to assist other people who have yet to hear of the forgiveness of sin, that they can find the forgiveness of sin just as you have in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, Jesus' resurrection gives purpose to those who follow him. And that purpose is announcing the forgiveness of sin. Let's look at this in this context and recognize several things. First of all, our purpose commences through grace. It is something that commences through grace. The initiative of grace is demonstrated here for us that the initiative of grace is God's. We don't have the ability to initiate grace. We are the recipients of grace. It is a passive thing that we receive from God, and it is he who initiates that. Throughout Luke's account of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he has emphasized the dependency the disciples had on the illuminating work of the Spirit of God. He is constantly pointing us back to uh, the Word of God as the foundation for our faith. Just in this same chapter, look back at verses 6 through 8, where the angels, on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, say to the women who are there looking at this open tomb, why do you seek the living one among the dead? Verse 5, verse 6, he is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. What did the angels do? They pointed them back to the word of Jesus Christ, the word of God. We've seen this. Skip to verse 27, where Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with Cleopas and his traveling companion. And it says, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scripture. He explained to them. That we talked several weeks ago, or maybe last week, about this idea of explained as the idea of open his word. That's what he wants us to do. That's what he wants us to do. On numerous occasions, the disciples were unable to comprehend the truth of God's word, demonstrating the struggle that exists without God initiating through illuminating our understanding and enabling us to understand. Look at Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 34. Then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all the things which are written through the prophets about the son of man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of the statement was hidden from them and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Without the grace of God, we have no ability to comprehend the word of God. But with the grace of God, we have all ability to comprehend. In chapter 24, verse 16 of our text, Luke chapter 24, verse 16, it says, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. That's when Jesus was with Cleopas. Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Standing in their presence, explaining the truth of the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. It is at the sovereign purpose of God, not only when he opens the mind to understand the scriptures, but for whom he opens the mind. It is at the discretion of God. It is at his time and for whom he chooses. And we have no ability to explain it. Jesus explained it in John 3. He says that where the wind, from whence the wind comes and where it blows, no one knows. It is up to the purpose, the eternal purpose of God. It's not whimsical. It is not uh, capricious. It is not something that is um, um, arbitrary but his selection as to who will receive such grace is deliberate, purposeful, and planned. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, the scripture says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. 
In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, it says, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is something that is accomplished through the power of God's Spirit, as Paul says there in 2 Thessalonians, whereby he illumines the blind eyes to see the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. No one can initiate this insight. It is something God initiates as he chooses us, the ones who will bring glory to him through our comprehension of the truth. God is gracious. And it is only by grace that we have come to know him, come to know the truth, come to understand the truth. We're debilitated from understanding unless God be gracious. And if God is at work opening your eyes and ears, do not harden your heart against him, but embrace that which God has provided you. He provides us the insights through grace. Such spirit-led insight is always connected directly to the word of God, and it is never independent from it. In verse 27 of Luke 24, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Verse 44, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. There is a constant pointing us back to thus saith the Lord. This is the word of God. Our faith is based not on sentiment, not on feeling, not on experience, not on visions, not on voices, but on the written word of God. That is where we're constantly pointed in the word of God. And there are so many people that are whoring after some experience, some voice, some word, and neglecting that gift that is to the fullest of flame. It is in the word of God. It will never happen independently of the word of God. In 1 John 5, verse 20, as we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. The word of God gives us understanding of the glory of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 and following, Paul prays that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. He is praying that we might be enlightened. What? Enlightened how? Enlightened what? Enlightened our hearts in response to the word of God so that we would know these things about Christ. It takes us back to Jesus. A faith that is not based on Jesus, it is not, that is not constantly being nourished and fed and into greater fullness by the agency and, and, and the uh, use of the word of God is a faith not worth your time. If it is not taking you to Christ, if it is not making you adore Christ, your faith is worthless. Becoming more religiously astute, becoming more religiously affected or disciplined, becoming more conservative, more moral, doesn't help you eternally. You can still die in your sin as a religious person, but you will never die of your sin 
if you find Christ, if you are redeemed by Christ. Hence, the Spirit of God opens our minds to understand the Scriptures. It does not focus on moralism, historical facts, or academic truths, but life-changing realizations, the comprehension of the spiritual realities of life that is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone to his glory. That is what our faith is. That's why it's impossible for us who come to know Christ to ignore him, to not serve him. On the side of my desk, I have a uh, laser engraved on the side of my desk, a quote from a guy named Laterno, R.G. Laterno. The quote says this, if you're not serving the Lord, it's because you don't love him. And if you do not love the Lord, it's because you do not know him. For to know him is to love him, and to love him is to serve him. I embrace that, and that's the heart that we must have. Emblazoned on the side of my desk, lest I forget the point. The point is Christ. Don't allow yourself to delight in your church. Don't allow yourself to delight in your religion, your morals, your data that you've accumulated and intellectually appreciate. but embrace that life-changing realization of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done to deliver you from your sin. A person for whom the Spirit of God opens the mind to understand the Scriptures, grasps the depth of the problem of their sinful offenses against God, the condemnation that is deserved, the righteousness that is found in the life of Christ and the desire for the escape from the power of sin through the work of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, the scripture says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. That's what it's about, and that's what Jesus Christ has come to provide. And that is what the Spirit of God is constantly enabling us to open our minds to, that he opens our minds to comprehend this, and it's at his initiative that he gives us insights. So the first thing we understand is, with reference to our purpose, is that it commences through grace. Our purpose also concentrates on the gospel. That's what it does. It, it, it concentrates on the gospel. Two things here. One is the accomplishments of Christ, and then secondly, the authority of Christ with reference to the gospel. Number one, the accomplishments of Christ. In verse 46, this is exactly what Jesus points to. Look at it, verse 46. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ will suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. The truth the Spirit of God wants to ensure we understand is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The message is the same as it had been contained throughout the Old Testament scriptures. That is why Jesus was able to go back to Moses and to the prophets and to the writings and to the Psalms and explain himself from the Old Testament throughout all of the scriptures. He was able to point and clarify and elucidate and illumine their understanding as to what those verses in the Old Testament that they had not ever comprehended before. They had never put them together before. And Jesus provides the synapses of these things and all puts them together. The message is the same. 
Genesis, for instance, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve, and between your seed and her seed. He, a reference to Christ, will bruise you on the head, a mortal wound, and you shall bruise him on the heel, a reference to the crucifixion, where he was pierced and then recovered through the resurrection. So yours is going to be an eternally mortal wound, Satan, but Jesus, you'll hurt, but he'll rise. Jesus would have explained this, what is called in the theological circles, the proto-evangelium, the first good news. First good news. He would have taken them back all the way to the beginning and seen how God promised that Jesus would die, but rise from the dead. Numbers chapter 21 Verses six through nine, where they had complained and God sent that plague of serpents and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard and it shall come about that everyone who has bitten When he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if a uh, serpent bit any man, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Jesus refers to this in the New Testament. And he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. As a fulfillment of a type of Christ in this pole upon which a serpent had been placed. All kinds of, of significance to that. Well, I'm not going to take the time to explain it all. Just simply to say, Jesus would have gone back to passages like this and explained, you know how that, those you know, serpents were lifted up and men were saved if they looked at it? I was lifted up and I'll save anyone who comes to me. <gasps> that's what that's about. Can you imagine the, the light bulb just going on? Just flashing, just popping as Jesus explained these things. Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11. For you will not allow, uh, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. Again, a reference to resurrection after death. In your presence is fullness of joy, ascension. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore as he is in session with God. Jesus would have explained that prophecy and how it was necessary for the Messiah to die, be buried, rise, ascend, and intercede. (gasps) That's what that verse is talking about? All of a sudden they understand. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and it will come and its end will come with a flood even to the end that there will be war. Desolations are determined. The Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Your crucifixion is what that refers to? (gasps) What? And many, many others. I just selected some out of all of the sections of scripture like Jesus said in our verse that with Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, that all these things had to be fulfilled. And he allows them to see these things. The fulfillment of these passages provided the grounds by which the Father is able to view those who turn to Christ Jesus as righteous. The fulfillment of these things was wrapped up in the crucifixion, in the burial, in the resurrection of Christ, in the ascension of Christ, and in the present ministry of Christ of interceding for us so that God can look upon us as righteous. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the gospel. This is what our purpose, it focuses on this. It concentrates on the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God 
and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It is all wrapped up in Christ. And that's the good news of the gospel. That Christ is not our judge. He's our savior. He's our forgiver. He's the one who has provided us the means by which we can be viewed by God as righteous, which gives him all authority. We who are enabled to understand and by grace are quickened to believe are charged to spread the word about what Jesus Christ has the power to do in the lives of sinners. Jesus is saying, tell people what I can do for them is essentially his message. Tell them what I can do, what I've done for you. That repentance, verse 47, look at it. That repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. The key provision Jesus has the authority to grant is the forgiveness of sins. This is something that throughout uh, Luke's gospel he's referenced. An example would be in Luke chapter 5, verse 24, where Jesus says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, go home. To demonstrate he has the authority to forgive sins. In Matthew chapter 28, in verses 18 and 19, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been granted me, given me, in heaven and on earth. And because all authority has been given to me, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. How do you do that? Tell them that their sins can be forgiven in my name. Proclaim the gospel to them. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul says it is in him, that is in Christ, that we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. It is connected to Christ. The work of grace that immediately follows the opening of the mind to the scriptures. So when God, by his grace and his initiative, gives us the insights to comprehend the word of God, the desire to gain forgiveness of sin is right after. He opens your mind, you understand the word of God, and immediately you understand that you're guilty of sin. You already knew it. You're already burdened and laden down by by the pack of sin that you've stuffed full. But all of a sudden, there's a desire to be rid of it, forgiven of it. And all of a sudden, a hope like a dawn springs upon your mind. And the light of the truth of the fact that forgiveness of sin is found in Christ causes you to desire Forgiveness. You want forgiveness, and that leads you to repentance. And it is through the further gift of grace that repentance does fall upon that soul that is so eager to find forgiveness in Christ Jesus that he grants you the gift of repentance from sin. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 25, it says the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. And why? Because what you are dependent upon is not the strength of your your argument, but on the power of the Spirit of God to open the mind of those that you're just patiently and gently teaching the Word of God. The Word of God's gonna do the work. It's like if those of you who play golf know that the harder you swing at the ball, the more likely the ball's gonna go kerflooey or kerplunk, as the case may be. My dad, when he was trying to teach me how to play golf, said, son, son, you don't kill the ball. Don't kill the ball. Let the club do the work. You have a bunch of clubs in your bag. Get the appropriate club. That'll go the appropriate distance based on its bevel. And then just hit it the same. Don't change your swing. Don't kill it. Let the club do the work. As a pastor, you know what I am told to do? Let the word do the work. Let the word do the work. Don't think that it's on the power of your persuasion or on your your ability to out-argue somebody, even though it is fun to out-argue somebody. That's a flaw I have. But that's not where it needs to be. It needs to be in the confidence of the word of God. Because what happens? The spirit of God uses the word of God to open the mind of the sinner to their need. And then what does he do after he does that? 
Notice what it says. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will, I just serve it up. Don't be quarrelsome, but be kind, patient. Let the word do the work because God will open their minds and lead them to repentance. It's a gift of his grace. Forgiveness of sins is available only to those who gain this benefit from God, that benefit of repentance. In Acts chapter 11, verse 18, when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life, that life being eternal life gained through the forgiveness of sin. So repentance is that which produces the forgiveness of sin. These people who teach a superficial gospel that all you have to do is believe, just believe, are leaving out that catalyst that makes it all powerful, which is the mercy of God falling upon the heart of the sinner that produces repentance that leads to life. Notice what Jesus says. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name. Independently of Jesus Christ and the repentance that understanding who he is causes, a person cannot know the forgiveness of sins. It is strictly and solely in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. In Acts chapter 10 verse 43, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' authority to forgive sins is not local or even regional, but is worldwide. Notice that Jesus says that this message, this good news, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, to all the nations. Matthew 28, 19 says, go ye into all the world, all the nations making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter one, verse eight says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And then Romans chapter 10 and verse 18. Romans chapter 10, verse 18, which declares, but I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and the words to the ends of the world God's heart is for the sinner everywhere, everywhere. And this is the drive train of not just evangelism, but global missions that causes Christians to say, if not I, who is gonna tell them? Am I just gonna assume somebody else will? Or should I? Well, Jesus says, it's incumbent upon all who have come to know him, to testify of him to the ends of the world, to all nations, Jesus says there in our text. Beginning from Jerusalem, let's start, let's start. But hold on, don't start quite yet. A couple things that need to happen. Verse 48, we have the third point or principle that is important, and that is that our purpose compels us as witnesses. Our purpose compels us as identifies those who are observed, who observed his resurrected body as those who were the immediate witnesses. He says in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. The word witness describes a person who testifies to the truth of a matter. In fact, the word witness is actually the word from which we get the English word martyr. Uh, the Greek word is martyrus, and it's from that word we get the word martyr, that you testify so avidly, faithfully, and unconditionally that you'll even die in order to give that testimony. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, 
How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So their testimony was empowered by the ministry of the Holy Spirit who granted them the ability to have God testifying through them with all kinds of miraculous is the Lord. And it was confirmed to us by those who heard. The intention of Jesus is that more than simply those who were alive when he was raised, but all who would believe after them, experiencing the same benefits of opened minds, repentance and faith and the forgiveness of sins that would be gained through the gospel. In John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. Who is that? That is I, you. We haven't seen him, but we believed. Why? Because of the word of God, which has produced faith and granted repentance and caused us to turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. And we believe. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, he says, And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the privilege of being witnesses. There is the promise that we will be witnesses. Jesus acknowledges their unsteady faith as they are introduced to this obligation and indicates that he promises that you will be my witnesses. So there's a double kind of a emphasis here. You are witnesses and you will be witnesses. He promises. In this text, Jesus uses the present tense. You are witnesses. But in Acts 1.8, which we've already read, he states, you shall be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This is the promise Regeneration, faith, repentance, and the forgiveness of sins causes a person to forever thereafter desire to testify about what Jesus has done and can do in them and in others. That's what they desire to do. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, Jesus indicates that this is the very thing he would accomplish. He said to them, follow me. I'll make you fisher of men. So if that's true, And you're not a fisher of men. What could, what's the only possible, do a syllogism quick in your mind. What's the only possible reason? It's because you're not following Jesus. Because Jesus says, you follow me, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Here he says, when I forgive you of your sin, you will be my witnesses. You are my witnesses. That's just who you are. Now go do that. Go do that, he says. Tell people about what I can do for them. Tell them what I've done for you. Tell them what I can do for them. Spread the word. Not just locally. Start locally. That's what he says here. Let's start in Jerusalem. But to the ends of the earth. Anybody that can hear. Anybody that will listen. Tell them. Tell them. But finally, and very quickly... Our purpose counts on the Spirit of God. Our purpose counts on the Spirit of God. The promise of the Spirit's presence. This is what we noted above. Jesus promises them that the fulfillment of the gift of God's Spirit. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. That's what he says in the first part of verse 49. The promise of my Father refers to the Holy Spirit. In uh, Ezekiel 36, verses 26 to 27, this is prophesied. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Jesus himself promised that the Holy Spirit would come. Look at John 14, 16 and 17, where it says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may that the spirit that has been promised to them will come. 
They didn't actually receive the Holy Spirit at that point, we understand, because they did not receive it until Acts 2. So this was a symbolic gesture, affirming and assuring them that the Spirit would come. And Jesus indicates that when the Holy Spirit comes, they would find the power they needed to fulfill their mission as witnesses. This is the provision of the Spirit's power. They would find that power needed. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now that verse has caused all kinds of kooky conclusions that I'm not to go anywhere until I'm clothed with power from on high. And so they wait for the power and nothing ever happens. And so they never go anywhere. They never share anything because they're waiting for the power. No, no, no. You have to put this in context in a normal hermeneutic and understand that what he is saying is that you're to stay in the city. Those specific people are to stay in the city until the day of Pentecost. We'll see that in just a moment. But this indicates that the gospel witness, Jesus expects all his followers to provide, the gospel witness he expects all of us to provide is not advanced by human resources, but power from on high through the Holy Spirit. So many people think, I can't share my faith. I I can't share my faith. The only reason that that truth would stop you is if you're relying solely on you. It's true. But if you recognize that the ability to be an effective witness is not dependent upon you, your intellect, your persuasiveness, your um, personality or anything like that, but is rather dependent on power from on high, that God expects to use you, God expects to use you, then it's a different matter altogether. Like the warning of Israel not to attempt to conquer the promised land without the assistance of God's spirit, believers are warned, don't attempt to proclaim the gospel in your own strength without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Don't do that. That'll end in disaster. Remember Numbers 42, where the spies came back, or not, uh, not Numbers 42, Numbers 14, when the spies came back and they said, oh, we can't go up. There, there's giants there. They have walled cities. They'll wipe us out. And Joshua and Caleb said, no, no, no. With God, we can do this. And all of Israel said, no, we side with the 10, not with the two. And so God says, okay, then you're going to wander around the wilderness for 40 years. Oh, what? what? Yeah, 40 years. All of you who are alive today, you're going to die. And your kids will inherit the land. Wait, okay, no. All right, well, we'll go. We'll go. We'll go. Let us go. And they all gather together to go. And God says, don't go. I'm not with you. Numbers 14, 42. Do not go up or you will be struck down before your enemies for the Lord is not among you. Affirming that the battle belongs to the Lord. It's not up to us. It's not our abilities. The same weaponry, the same strategems, the same everything. 40 years later, that they had their exposure, their disposal, was used and was successful. Why? Because God was with them. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, gathering them together, he, Jesus, commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. He says in Luke, stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Here he says, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. When you have the power of the Spirit as your clothing, then, starting in Jerusalem, going to Judea, then into Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the world, you will be a powerful witness. Without the power from on high, believers would be defeated. But with the power from on high, through the Holy Spirit, believers are unbeatable, the very gates of hell unable to prevail against us. Well, let me close with so what? So what? There are four. First, forgiveness of sin is impossible without Christ. Sinners must come to him in faith and repentance for forgiveness. If you're here today and you've never come to Christ alone, you've maybe included Christ, but you've really relied more on yourself 
your own good works, your attendance in church, your giving, your keeping commandments, your deprivations or asceticism or some other thing that somebody's going to look at. Maybe you sold flowers on a street corner. There are, there, are, there are innumerable numbers of things that people have proposed that are going to enable you to find favor with God. And until you strip yourself naked, as they say, and come strictly to the Lord for his mercy and grace, offering him nothing except your sin for removal, then you need to come to him in faith and repentance, turning to him for forgiveness of sin, for independently of Christ, the forgiveness of sin is forever elusive, forever. Secondly, proclaiming forgiveness of sin through Christ is possible only when we've known such forgiveness and unavoidable after we've known such forgiveness. You can't help it. He makes you fisher men. He makes you a witness. You can't help it. If you really know Jesus, you really witness about Jesus. Which ought to shake some of us up because we've never opened our mouths to tell anybody about what Jesus Christ has done and can do. That ought to shake you up. The Holy Spirit is given to us for the purpose of empowering us to proclaim Christ. It's one of the principal purposes of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And finally, our purpose is to tell others that Jesus lives to grant them forgiveness of sins. Understand, Jesus is telling us in our text that his resurrection gives purpose to all those who will follow him. May that describe us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to understand it, that we have a purpose in life, and that is to tell others about the glories of Christ, what he has done for us, what he can do for them. There are so many people who are groping about seeking solutions, wandering like pilgrims, looking for a way to offload their burden of sin, finding no way. Help us to point them to Christ, sharing with them the good news. Help us to fulfill our purpose to the glory of Jesus himself. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.